Welcome back, everyone, to another edition of Evenings with Steve. This is my 30th program, but of course, it's special for two reasons. It's special, firstly, because we're in the sanctuary. We're not doing it by Zoom, but we have close to 200 people from around the world watching this program by live stream. I'm very grateful for that. And it's special for another reason, because of our guests. You're in for a real treat this evening. I know you've, I know you've, you've come for, uh, out for an evening, you're watching live stream, you're committing an hour of your time, but you're, as I say, you're in for a real treat. All right, well, I'm, I'm sorry. You know, I finished the Zoom world and I thought the technical problems were over, but clearly, <laughs> clearly they're continuing and this is going to persist. So again, welcome everyone again to Evenings with Steve, and I'm thrilled to be hosting this program. My name is Steve Skirka. So before I introduce our distinguished guest, just a couple of preliminary comments. First of all, there will be a dessert reception for those of you here. You'll have a chance to meet Marie Hennen, our, gu our guest this evening, but please keep your time brief with her because I'm sure that a lot of people are going to want to to speak to her and say hello, and that will be for half an hour. Uh, there will be books available, signed copies of Marie's book outside the sanctuary, and for those of you watching on live stream, you'll be able to purchase the book, signed copies, by phoning the synagogue office. And finally, you'll see, for those of you attending here, small pieces of paper with pencils. Those are for written questions. Please put your first name on the paper, write a succinct question, and please don't ask her about a particular case. I'm going to try to devote some of this hour uh, looking at those questions and, and posing them to Marie. So now I want to introduce our speaker, Marie Hennon. Marie Hennon is the most famous criminal, you know, that's hard for me to say as a criminal lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> the most famous criminal lawyer in Canada, and she deserves the recognition. But, but more importantly, she's a dear friend of mine. We've been friends for many, many years. And the first time I met Marie is when she actually wrote me a note, she doesn't even remember this, congratulating me on a case that I'd won. And I thought that was, that was very special. So we're very dear friends, we've colleagues, we've had interesting cases, interesting cases uh, over the years. We'll just leave it at that. And, um, and so you have the benefit of this being a genuine conversation, not an interview, comfortable conversation. And I'm going to start with this, Marie. You know, you come to our community, you're embraced, you're revered by many here. But what's interesting when I read your book is that that almost universally isn't the case when you speak elsewhere, that you're a target of derision, that you're controversial. You're polarizing, that's the way you're described, which is obviously not true. And that strong objections are raised when you come to, to speak at various events. And there's one that you, you write about in your book where they actually had counselors available in the lecture hall as Marie spoke, presumably because the people would be traumatized as they listen to you speak. So what, what's, you're, you're, so, you're so sweet, how, how do you? <laughs> I don't know that anyone would say that. I, I, I do. How, how, do you, how do you generate such, such hostility? Well, I don't take the, the hostility personally. Uh, I think the thing that's generating the hostility, there are a couple of things. Uh, one is the job that I do, that we both do, which is being a criminal defense lawyer, which is very difficult for some people to understand, members of the public. Uh, it's easy for them to identify you with the crime or your client. And so, because I think there's a lot of confusion about what it is that we do as criminal defense lawyers, uh, I think that's where that derision comes from. But the second place it comes from, and, and this one is uh, less understandable to me, uh, is uh, one that's gendered. Uh, I'm certainly not the first person in the history of the world to be a criminal defense lawyer, certainly not the first one in Canada, and certainly not the first one to do uh, high profile cases. And so part of the um, derision is directed at the fact that I'm a female doing this job and all that that imports. 
Uh, so the first, I am more than happy to engage in a conversation with members of the public and explain why it is I do what I do. Uh, the second, I have less time for. Yeah. So, so this is a quote from your book on the same topic of uh, being a woman, being a female defense lawyer. And you wrote, being a female defense lawyer is particularly polarizing, but then again, being a female anything is. And so we have a lot of women in our audience, younger, older, some embarking on careers. And you, you've overcome that barrier. There's no question about the fact that whatever anyone throws at Murray Hannon, you're going to open the door and get through. And so what advice do you give to women who have to deal with that barrier as, as they go through life? Well, I think, first of all, those barriers uh, for women exist um, across the board. If you're in science, if you're in technology, the statistics in politics, uh, if you look at how many uh, female prime ministers we've had in this country, I mean, the, the story, it tells itself. Uh, so uh, we all uh, face these barriers. Uh, th those are our barriers just in North America, but of course across the world, uh, the barriers for women are, are far greater than that. Um, how do you overcome them? Well, I think as I talk about in my book, I grew up in a, a bit of a delusional environment because I came from a very matriarchal background. And I uh, grew up uh, with uh, a family that did not treat me differently. Uh, my mother only had one aspiration for me, which is to be a professional. Uh, she could care less whether I got married. It was not a conversation. We didn't have that sort of aspiration. And so I didn't think of myself any differently than uh, a man. I just assumed I would live my life the same way a man lives their life. And I think I was also very lucky when I came into my professional career uh, that I worked with Eddie Greenspan and he treated me the same. He, uh, in fact, we would laugh in the office that he tended to have more confidence in the female lawyers than the male lawyers in the office. So he too uh, dealt with me in a way that just it never occurred to me that I was any different. So as I was doing what I was doing, I, I just assumed that was regular and nobody was looking at me any differently. Uh, I think where it became uh, more difficult uh, to be candid is as you get older, and I'm now 30 years into my practice, there are very few of us left. And uh, so you, you feel a bit lonely <laughs> and uh, you feel really unwelcome uh, because there's just few of us uh, there and uh, we all know about the glass ceiling, uh, which you're allowed to hit your head against, but you're not supposed to bust through. Uh, so, you know, the seat at the table isn't, uh, isn't being offered. Uh, nobody likes to give up the seat of power. And so you begin to feel that more as you move through your career and you have, uh, there are less of you uh, left. So do you, do you tolerate that or, or do you fight back? Do I tolerate it? Well, I don't think I tolerate much no. of that, no. That was a provocative um, question. <laughs> <laughs> um, but do, am I aware of it? There's yeah. no question I'm very much aware of it. Uh, and that's why I think the visibility of, of women is very important. I, I think it's important for members of the public to see and, and perceive a defense lawyer as being female and not thinking that that's an unusual thing, that that's what you identify. Uh, so our presence, our, our visibility, I think, is, is very important uh, in the step to, to try to defeat that or adjust attitudes. Okay. So you write about becoming a, a criminal defense lawyer, you have to give up part of your life, that, that mm -hmm. it's not natural for you to be the same person going in as you are during your career and, and coming out. So I want to take the flip side of that question and ask you about what's rewarding about being a criminal defense lawyer. What are the best moments that you have as, as a lawyer as you go through your uh, for me, um, the best moments, in terms of the actual practice, uh, the best moments are moments where you feel you contributed something, that you made a, a difference. And I don't mean that as in a generic, I made a difference. Uh, it's uh, that your participation, your, your intellect, your involvement made an actual difference to the outcome. That is profoundly fulfilling uh, to me, to be able to uh, to contribute and to navigate people and to resist uh, the power of the state. I'm oppositional by nature. Um, and so uh, having the opportunity to be able to do that and help people navigate, as you know, 
uh, profoundly difficult, extraordinarily crushing moments in their lives that change everything um, is, is a very fulfilling thing. So let's talk a bit about your background. It's the first part of the book, and mm -hmm. it, it is very absorbing. And I'll just show everyone the book, Nothing But the Truth, Marie Hannon. And, and I, I told Marie, one of the unusual features of this book, it's the first book ever written by a lawyer about himself or herself, where there isn't a single case or client's name identified in the book. That's how modest uh, my guest is here. She writes about issues, social justice issues, issues around her background, issues about, but never boasting about a single case that she's ever been. But having said that, Marie, let's talk a bit about your background. You grew up in, in Egypt, your family's, your family's from Cairo. Mm -hmm. I'm sure every woman's interested in knowing something about your history, how it is you came to Canada. Sure, um, so uh, my uh, family, both my parents were born in Cairo. Um, and uh, my, uh, my grandparents, it's predominantly Lebanese origin, three and one Palestinian. Um, they moved to uh, Cairo, uh, where my parents were born. So they identified, I think, as Kyrenes, as Egyptians. I was born in Cairo as well. Uh, they're, uh, because they're Lebanese, they were Maronite Christians, and um, it became very difficult for them to live there, particularly for my father, who is a professional, he's a pharmacist, not was, he's alive, fortunately, um, and uh, they needed to leave. They just felt that as the country was uh, converting, what they would say is reverting, um, and their way of life, which was a bit more European, um, was disappearing, they just couldn't function there. They didn't think it was a good place to raise children or raise a daughter. And so they moved. The first place they moved was to Vancouver because my mom had an uncle who was living there. Uh, that didn't go well. Uh, she couldn't speak the language. Uh, she found it very white um, and found it very uh, lonely. Uh, so they moved back to Egypt. Uh, they then moved to Lebanon. Um, and from Lebanon, they moved, my, my mom's family moved back to Toronto, moved to Toronto. We came, we moved back to Lebanon, and uh, then uh, my uh, Lebanon exploded uh, and also wasn't hospitable. And so my dad finally said, that's it, we're, we're giving up on the Middle East and, uh, and moved here. You, you describe in the book one instant where you, you're with a cab driver and he says, where are you from? Right. And you, you just give an answer and he says, no, no, where are you really from? And I'm just interested to know is, is your background as an immigrant, your family being immigrants to this country, that shape your views of, of, as being a lawyer? Uh, uh, well, I think it shaped my views in so many ways. You know, when I started writing the book, to a certain extent, and you know this when you're writing, uh, certain chapters write themselves, and you begin thinking you're going to write about one thing, and it ends up being about something completely different. So it's a bit of a form of therapy, and I didn't like it, because I hate being so introspective. <laughs> but the one thing that was really striking to me uh, is that where it began about my life and being an immigrant is exactly where it ended. Um, and I, I think what, what was stunning is I just don't think I've ever overcome that, that question, where are you from, that sense that you don't belong, that we're not entitled to be in this country that we contribute so much to. And I knew that in writing a very personal story, I was really writing the story of so many of us Whose, uh, whose families came to this country. And, and I just wanted to explain to a lot of people who I don't think understand what it feels like to, to feel that sense of urgency, to feel that sense of displacement, to feel that sense of, of, of hope, to feel all those things, to feel like you're part from there and part from here, all of it, and how generationally we feel it so differently. Um, and I wanted to, to share that because I was, you know, I remember my publisher said, oh, your story is so unique. And I said, well, no, it's actually the most common story. There's so many of me out there. There's so many of us who've lived this experience. And that was probably the most um, personally surprising thing because it, it just, that's, the book ended that there where it began with this, this sense that I've just never been able to, to honestly to shake. Um, it's a thing that's just always 
with you, that you're just reminded you don't quite belong. And you were, you write about 9-11, where that, sure, of course, became yeah, more pronounced. Course. So let's talk, now you go into law, you want an article, and there's only one law firm that right. you want an article for, one lawyer, and that's the legendary Eddie Greenspan, who uh, sadly passed away about five years ago or so. And um, why did you want to work for Eddie so much? Because for me, he was the absolute epitome of what a criminal defense lawyer should be. And, you know, it's not for everybody. Everyone makes their own decisions. I never regretted that decision because it was exactly what I anticipated. He was exactly the type of lawyer that I wanted to be and that I, that I admired. Uh, I learned a great deal, um, but the most important thing was his unwavering, just uncompromising commitment to the role that we have, to, to, to believing that being a defense lawyer was a profoundly honorable profession. It was, you know, the way you look at To Kill a Mockingbird, not the way lawyers are portrayed nowadays. It was like that, it was old school. And he believed it to the core, and he worked in that way, and so that's what I wanted, that's what I thought we should be, and so I was very fortunate. Um, and it also felt very much like home to me, I, I think, uh, because there's just a lot of cultural similarity. It felt I couldn't do Bay Street. I mean, that was never going to happen. That wasn't going to be a place I could feel at home. And I remember when I left, I said, I feel like I've got to leave home now. Like, this is the time for me to go and open up my own firm. But it really did feel for me like leaving home. Um, so so you, you described Eddie Greenspan this way as a combination of Clarence Darrell and Rumpel of the Bailey. Yeah. Because he had that indefatigable, you know, vigorous, robust view of defending the law, but also he was a caricature. He Absolutely. was wickedly funny, and he yeah. had a bit of rump pull in him, too. It yeah, was one a, person. he was very, he's a larger than life, very dynamic uh, person. He was a big personality. Right, and, and that's, that's my next question. How important is it, do you think, to be a big personality in a courtroom? When you walk into that courtroom, you have it. Right type personality. You know, how, how significant is that in persuading a juror or the point of view that you're promoting? Uh, well, I think it is, it is uh, very significant because our tools, our, our skills when you come to our office is not only our experience and, and hopefully our intellect and our, our knowledge about the law, but at the end of the day, the person that stands up for you, that speaks on your behalf, is your lawyer. And so you know, everything about them is important. And, and I always say to young lawyers, as much as it's about you, because you are center stage, your, you know, your success or failure impacts the client in a very real way. Your performance matters. It's actually not about you, because you get to go home. And so there's this really interesting combination, right, in the sense that you've got a job which is about you and your center stage, and at the end of the day is, is not about you. It's, it's, uh, you're actually... Uh, you have to uh, give yourself over to the job and to your client, and, and walking that line, uh, I think, is important. In terms of, of personality, you know, that, that's, I think Eddie used to say, you know, 90% of, of, of cases, any lawyer, a good lawyer or a bad lawyer, will get the same result, but it's the 10%. Right. It's the 10% where that, there is, and that's the difference. That's, that's the thing. And that's that, the top tier of the criminal bar yeah. that will win those. The hard, the, the really hard, hard cases, hard yeah. yeah. And that's when you sent me that letter. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> really, you're one you of those felt, lawyers. You felt yeah. an affinity to me, yeah, and you didn't different. know me, and you went, you know, I really just want to commend you on winning that case. So let, let's talk about this. You know, there's, now we're going to move into the role of the defense lawyer more generically. And so let me just pose a question, which I know you will know it doesn't come from me, but what do you think of the defense lawyer who says, look, I'm only going to defend the virtuous part, the client with the just cause, the client who may be unjustly, unfairly targeted by the police, but not the unpopular cases, not that segment of cases where people go, how can anyone defend that case? Do you think that lawyers have the ability or the right to, to segregate defending cases that way? Well, I mean, I, I think there's two, two schools of thought about that. You know, there's the cab rank 
rule, which is the view that uh, you must accept any case that, that comes into your office. As a lawyer, your obligation is to defend everybody. Uh, there's the other view that, you know, that may be something that is relevant if you're living in a small town and you're the, the only person in town that can provide that service, but in a big city like uh, like Toronto, you don't have that obligation because if it's not your office, there's an office down the street, and so a person won't be deprived of a defense uh, if you choose not to. Uh, so where I, I come on that argument is it's a personal choice for every lawyer. Every lawyer will decide. What I will tell you is the last thing you want is a lawyer that's having a tough time defending you because they have a moral issue with you. And if that's how you feel as a lawyer, you should not take that case. You actually should do the client the service of saying, for a variety of reasons, I think you should retain somebody else. I'm not the right person for you. And you know, sometimes I will say I'm not the right person for you for different reasons. I draw my line in the sand, uh, not perhaps by the type of case that, that it is, but if I find the client difficult, for example, a person that I don't think I'm going to be able to work well with, I'll say, well, you and I are not going to work well together. I think you should go somewhere else. So we all draw lines. Um, in the sand of what will work and what will not work. Um, I believe, I'm a bit old school, I believe that when you come to my office, you retain a defense lawyer, you're not coming for me to grade you on your morality, uh, your behavior, you're not coming, uh, I'm not uh, there to take a confession from you. That's not my job. My job is very focused. I'm here to defend you within ethical bounds and to assist you to navigate a problem. And I have a role in the architecture of the justice system, but I'm not there to judge you. Uh, that is not my role. And so I am of that school. That it's, it's, my view is I'm not gonna reject your case because I don't like you or I don't like what you're alleged to have done. Yeah, I, I wonder if you agree with what I'm gonna suggest to you, which is that one of the lessons from the wrongful conviction cases is that the unpopular case sometimes is the virtuous case. And if you look at Guy Pomeran, for example, sure. there were petition signed to keep him in yep. jail and not let him get bail. And then, of course, we know that he was exonerated and proven innocent. Do you think that that's also... Well, important? I think that drives our views, for, right. for sure, that, that we know that you cannot judge, uh, that you often get it wrong, that right. the, the system is very human. Uh, and so we make mistakes because we're human. And so we know that. And I think that drives our view that everybody's entitled to a defense and our role is extremely important in, in the justice system. But, you know, if it's something that makes you uncomfortable, then don't do it. All right. So there is a, a change. Marie graciously said to me, look, Steve, let people stand up and ask questions. So I, I stand corrected and I wanted to explain why. So I'm actually going to give you an opportunity to stand up and, 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 and ask questions uh, soon so you can start thinking so I want to read um, a passage from your book, Marie, and then ask you a question about it. I'm nervous. I don't know which no, one it is. No, you're never nervous. <laughs> you're never nervous. <laughs> OK. Here are the questions I get asked most often as a criminal defense lawyer. How can you defend someone you know is guilty? How can you defend someone charged with a heinous crime? How can you, as a woman, defend a man charged with sexual assault? How can you as a parent defend someone charged with abusing a child? And I can tell you that every criminal defense lawyer has been asked all of these questions. I mean, of course, not a man about being a woman, but asked these questions in some form many times during the course of the career. Do you, do you see any moral dilemma with, with any of the questions that are posed to you? And, and what is your answer to those questions? No, I, and I understand why members of the public would ask those questions because uh, they don't quite understand what your role is. Uh, they don't understand that uh, the power of the state is enormous when they select you for prosecution. I know everybody thinks, uh, the, they always say the accused have all the rights, and I always say, well, no, we all have all the rights, right. not the accused. The accused isn't placed in the unfortunate position of having to assert some of those rights, which none of us would like to have to do. Um, but members of the public just don't understand why we choose to do this. And when you understand the power of the state, when you understand where we came from, why we have the justice system that we do, why we require 
uh, the police and the prosecution to prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt, not just select anybody they want. Uh, and what your job is, which is to hold them to that value system, which is part of our democratic system. Our justice system is integrally related to our justice, our, our democratic system. And I'll give you an example. If you think an election has been stolen, you go to a courtroom and a judge decides. If you don't like vaccine mandates, you go to a courtroom and a judge decides. And a lawyer argues both sides of it and an independent judge will make a decision. So our role is to present one aspect of an argument and the court hears both sides. So I think my role is extremely important. Can you imagine if you didn't have that other side? If you didn't have someone speaking up for an accused person, just as we want people to speak up for the prosecution. And we want both sides to be heard. So uh, I, I understand what I do, and I think, I think when we talk about it, we get it. But you know what's surprising to me, Stephen? I, I was talking um, last week about this, is that I get asked this question now, not by members of the public, but by lawyers and law students. And I find that very, very disheartening, because yes. you should know why we do what we do. And, and, and it is quite common that there's a cynicism that we were talking about a little bit earlier um, about why we do what we do amongst our own profession. And th that's disappointing. Very disappointing. Let's talk, I want to ask you one question about the Charter of Rights, and then I'm going to turn to the audience and see if you have any questions. So as, as, as you know, we have a relatively fresh constitution. If you look at America 1776, ours is the year, early 1980s. And, and I found something very interesting that you wrote, uh, very insightful, which was that the limits of what the state and police can and cannot do, very often litigated in the context of a criminal case. Mm -hmm. But then you went on to say something important, which is everyone, not just the accused in that individual case, everyone in this room, everyone watching on live stream, benefits by what comes out of that legal decision. So can you explain why? Sure. Um, if, l let me give you a, an example. If the police um, bust your door down and they search your house and they find absolutely nothing and they say, sorry we interrupted you watching TV tonight, watching this podcast, um, I guess we made a mistake, we'll see you later. And they walk out. That's generally the end of the matter. But if they bust your door down and they find drugs and someone is charged, what's going to be litigated is their right to bust down somebody's door, your door. And so what happens is it's only when there's a crime that's been uh, alleged that these constitutional issues are often uh, addressed. So for example, one of, one of the very common ones is uh, the police harassing, we know, racialized members of the community, stopping them when they're driving. Steve, you have argued a, a very important case on this, driving while black. And that happens relentlessly. Now that never gets litigated until something is found. And then someone like Steve will litigate the fact that that stop was motivated, was racially motivated, not motivated uh, by what the police's authority is. And so the court will rule on when can the police stop somebody and when they, they cannot. Now we all benefit as a result of that ruling, but it's only the accused that has the, the unfortunate opportunity to have to assert that right. There are very few cases in a civil context where uh, people's rights are violated by the state and they do litigate it. And the reason is in a civil context, it's a choice to sue the police, for example. And there are a lot of costs to people going through that. But if you're criminally charged, you don't have a choice. You're coming to court, and you're gonna have to litigate the issue. And so, uh, you know, I, I do always hate people saying, well, the accused have all the rights. They do not have all the rights uh, at all. And none of you would wanna be accused and having to assert your rights. But it is in on the backs of those people, often marginalized people, that what the police and what the state can and cannot do whether they can clear a protest or not, whether, whether they can freeze your bank account because you've donated to a protest or not, whether they can invoke the Emergency Act or not, whether they can search your home or not or stop you while you're driving, all those things, they're litigated often in the context of criminal, uh, of criminal law. 
Even abortion laws were litigated, right to die litigated in that context. The legalization of drugs, that all happened initially when people were challenging those criminal laws. So the way we live, and that's why we love, and then I'll stop, we love criminal law so much, I think, is that it really does impact how we choose to live our lives. It not only tells us how we organize ourselves, how we're gonna deal with each other, but importantly, how the government is allowed to deal with us. And, and it's, it's absolutely fascinating and important. So let me ask if anyone has a question, could they please stand up? Don't be shy. Please stand up, sir. Could you just say your first name, please? We're not, we're not being asked, no, no questions about particular cases. Okay, so in general. Yeah, no, I, I know the case. Let's talk about that, that question um, generally, because I think it's an important question that you're asking, uh, which is, you know, what happens when you look at any case, you get an opportunity to get all of the evidence, um, and does that impact what you can and cannot do? Uh, and of course it does actually impact what you can and cannot do for a number of reasons. Uh, number one, as I always tell um, young lawyers, do not assume you're the smartest person in the room. You're not. You're not gonna win a case by fooling anybody. The judge is smarter than you. The prosecution is probably smarter than you. So don't walk into a case thinking that if there's a really big problem, nobody's gonna notice it if you don't talk about it. It's not a good strategy. But the second thing is that there are constraints, ethical constraints that we have uh, when we look at evidence. So I'll, I'll give you a concrete example. We're not gonna talk about specific uh, cases, um, and you have the evidence wrong, but we're not going to talk about that. Um, but let me give you a specific, uh, a specific example. If a client comes to you and they're charged, let's say, with robbery, and um, you are going to defend them, and they say to you, look, uh, I, I was there, but I, I, I was in the bank, but I, I wasn't the person who did the robbery. You can challenge all sorts of things. You can challenge the identification evidence. You can question the witnesses about that. But I cannot say, well, my, my client was in Florida when this happened, because I know there's evidence that my client was there. Uh, if there's DNA evidence, for example, it's really, really hard to argue that your client wasn't there. So you may have a, a defense of self-defense, but you're now constrained in what your defense is. So remember, we, we talk about those two things. One, nobody's stupid. You have to look at what the evidence is. But two, you have ethical obligations, which means I can't advance a lie to the court. And there is a difference between saying, you have to prove your case. Can you identify my client? And saying, well, my client wasn't even here. He was in, in Florida. He was just out of the country. So you are constrained by, by the evidence in terms of what you can and cannot do in court and what submissions you can and cannot make. So I think you had a question. Just your first okay. name, please. Hi, Lil. All right. Um, you, you are our <laughs> uh, So that's a really great question. Uh, let me first of all talk about some places where there is more of an interdisciplinary um, connection. What you're talking about is lawyers with other types of professionals, for example, accountants. So if you go to some of the major accounting firms, you will know that they have a legal department. So there's an entire legal department, then there's forensic accounting, there's an accounting sex section, and so there is that interdisciplinary um, practice. In the United States, you have a bit more of an interdisciplinary practice where, where there is that intersection. In Canada, you do not. Uh, law firms tend to be uh, full of lawyers, and they're run by lawyers, 
and lawyers aren't business people. So one of the debates actually in some of the larger firms are should you have business people coming in and running a law firm because lawyers don't know how to run, run a business. Um, but we have not progressed to the point of having interdisciplinary uh, practices where you've got in one, in one firm, let's say, um, different types of disciplines. And so the only area that I've seen it really um, flourish a bit more and, and somehow be more accepted is in the accounting area. Does that answer your question? Okay. All right. And, and I should mention, Marie, that you have a law firm now and has criminal law and, and civil. civil law. So yeah. you actually cross both. We do both. both. You do both. All right. So let me ask you a tough question. Oh, right. Yeah. This is a tough question. So you, you write in your book that there's a difference between attacking a judge's ruling and be and between attacking a judge and clearly attacking a judge and we see this routinely in America um, is is not to happen obviously but let's talk about criticizing judges and I wonder if, if we cut too much slack to judges in this country and we don't don't look at rulings you know mm -hmm. as, as you know as, as I mean, you're saying it's okay, but do we really do that? Do we do that? Well, uh, you know, I think members of the public and the um, and the media certainly uh, are uh, right. very proactive. But I think at the appellate court level, which is maybe what you're you're directing your question, yes. um, in the last, I think there has been a shift in the willingness to uh, take a hard look right. at what a judge is doing. Uh, and I think those of us who practice in in the appellate area. Uh, would say that that shift has impacted on reducing the reviewability of cases because appellate courts take the view that you have to defer to the trial judge uh, on a large range of issues and so they don't want uh, effectively don't want to give a second kick at the can but it, it's reflected itself in a lot of different ways I'm not going to focus on the areas but it's it's reduced uh, the reviewability and so some people do say uh, that uh, that's probably not a good development uh, to to scale back when an appellate court will intervene and interfere and overturn something. So you, you do write in your book, and I'm going to ask for the audience after this question, so please think if you have a question, about the whole infusion of politics in criminal law, the whole law and order campaign, which you, you obviously have a resistant view to. And why do you think it's it's wrong or even offensive for politics, politics to, to move into what we do as criminal defense. Well, I, because I think when we look at it historically, first of all, uh, and I'm sure many of you know, uh, criminal laws are highly racialized and highly designed to deal with marginalized communities. If you look at the way that the drug laws uh, emerged in the United States, for example, you will know that it was very, very racialized um, and uh, you know, initially uh, dealing with Asian communities, uh, dealing with the opium laws, and then subsequently uh, the black community. And that, uh, these were targeted uh, things uh, designed uh, to uh, hit a particular segment of society. Uh, so when politicians wade into criminal law, it's very rarely because they're genuinely concerned about anything other than an additional vote. And it's always very easy to say to the public, you know, you're unsafe in your home and uh, all you're suffering, I'm gonna tell you what the problem is. It's that guy over there. Uh, that's who's out there committing crimes and, and but for that, um, our lives would be so much better. And the fix to that is so easy because it's so cheap. Um, all you do is pass a law. You pass a law that's a mandatory minimum sentence, for example. And then what you see is that our jails are full of the most marginalized people in Canada. The overrepresentation of the indigenous community in jail is shocking. It's, it's, it's actually alarming. Uh, I'll give you an example that in Saskatchewan, statistics I, I, I think I looked at were that 90% of the women in jail are indigenous, but they, they constitute a small percentage of the population. And that's across the country. In the United States, the mass incarceration uh, of African Americans is is a crime. It's a crime. And so that happens because politicians say, I'm going to get tough on crime. And it's an easy thing to say. It's an easy sell. Um, it, it, it 
pretend, it's, they pretend that they're on the right side of, of things, and it's not true. Um, and so I don't think they should be uh, wading in in the way that they are. And let me just be very clear that, because I think people think the shot's only at the right, but it's, I'm an equal opportunist because, um, you know, the, the conservatives and the liberals both do it, right? It's just depending on what crime they pick to get tough on crime. But the constituency uh, is always members of the public to say to them uh, that, you know, I'm gonna explain to you why your life isn't as great as it should be, and it's these people. Uh, and that just, that just picks on the marginalized. So, you know, the days of law reform commissions where you'd have really thoughtful um, engagement about criminal law and rehabilitation and all of that, that, those just aren't part of the political dialogue anymore. So I wanna turn to this side right side, have a question, you want to stand up, please? Yes, please stand up. Your first name, please. Hi. Could you speak up so we can't hear you? Yeah. Sure. Uh, well, I think, you know, society, we all have this problem, which is we have short memories. We forget what history has taught us. Um, and we're very insular in the sense that we only look at what's happening in front of us and don't look across the world. So there are parts of the world where uh, defense lawyers who are defending the people, the right of people to protest, uh, the right of people to, um, to speak their mind, uh, I can think of many Middle Eastern countries where it is a risk to be a defense lawyer. They're not viewed as anything but, but heroes for taking on uh, work that threatens their lives. Uh, in North America, we won't, are, we're not in that same category, but I think what we have taken for granted uh, is our democracy, and we should all be very concerned about where we are right now as we see this, and we should remember that in the architecture of a democracy, which has the, you know, the executive, the elected government, um, that one of the checks on that is an independent judiciary and an independent bar. That's how we keep the government honest. That's how we say to them, you can't do that uh, to citizens. And we forget all that. So I think that's why people have those feelings about, about defense lawyers. And I think when we have conversations, I hope like this, we remind ourselves of why we, uh, we want people on, you know, prosecutors and defense lawyers and judges, we want all those roles uh, filled. How would, how would Eddie of Greenspan have answered that question? A little more aggressively than me. <laughs> 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 okay, so we'll, we'll take two more questions and then I'm gonna ask a question. Yes, in the back. Just your first name, please. Hi. 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 Yes, sir. Well, that's, I mean, that's something that is very well known. We were just talking moments ago about Guy Paul Moran, and, and that was part of that case, of course, was uh, a jailhouse informant. Um, and I'll, I'll give you as neutral a perspective as I can. Uh, so not the defense lawyer's perspective, just maybe a, a broader perspective. Uh, the, the business of policing, what courts would say to you is that when you're policing and when you're policing certain types of crimes, uh, you gotta use every technique you have available to you. So one of the techniques is an informant. Um, one of the other techniques that we may have read about, some of you may have seen stuff about this, is the Mr. Big, where police go undercover and pretend to be part of a criminal organization to elicit confessions. So we understand that when you're conducting investigations of crime, you have to give police a certain leeway, right? This is not a clean business. And the way we deal with that then is we have to put very strict constraints on that type of evidence because we also know that there are a lot of dangers associated with that. Uh, so with an undercover police informant where there is a deal, where there is a motivation for them to offer up, those are all things that a court can consider and should consider and we deal with that in two ways. One, we say the state has to tell us about it, you have to disclose it, that's optimal, so we know what's the deal. And number two, the court can consider all of that in assessing uh, the credibility of that person. Marie, can I give a quick jailhouse yeah, informant please. story? Thank you. So I was uh, counsel to all the prosecutors in the province of Ontario 
on the inquiry that looked into Guy Paul Moran's case, his conviction, and his exoneration. And the jailhouse informant testified at the inquiry. We knew that he was lying, but he stuck with his story that Moran had confessed to him. Remember, we knew incontrovertibly that it was false. And I'm a sophisticated lawyer, and I listened in that courtroom, and I had to fight myself from believing that this jailhouse informant wasn't telling the truth because he did it so forcefully, so passionately, and apparently truthfully. That's the danger of the jailhouse informant, that these witnesses testifying falsely influence false verdicts. All right, sorry, I had to say that. No, no, it's, it, but it's, it's a great question. And, you know, I think as in, in criminal law, in law in general, I mean, nothing is a clear line. That's what makes it sort of fascinating. And you're always trying to balance all of these competing interests to try to get to the, the, the correct result. All right, so we, yes, please stand and just tell us your first name. I can attest to that. <laughs> <laughs> I think you have to force, uh, certainly in the legal context, uh, the, the promotion and elevation of, of women uh, to leadership roles, and, and that requires a commitment. And I do not believe, if you want me to be honest, that that commitment's ever gonna come, because if you're king, why would you ever give up your throne? That just makes no sense. You wanna hold on to power. So I'll tell you what is causing a bit of change. What's causing a bit of change is the clients. Uh, particularly on, on in these very large firms and corporate firms and civil firms where clients are coming to them, and this has happened in the States, uh, and you'll see why diversity committees are popping up all over the place, where clients say, you know, I'm choosing between a bunch of law firms, tell me what your team is. Because one of the factors I'm going to consider is the composition of your team. And so you see them trying to, to deal with this problem, because it's a, it's a business problem for them. But the big issue, is that they don't have any senior people because they haven't promoted women, right? They've, they've pushed them right out. And so they're now reckoning with this. So I think one of the solutions is really coming externally uh, where the expectation from clients is that you're going to have uh, females in, in, in senior roles. That's number one. Number two is that I, I think we have to uh, be given the runway um, to, to do what we need to do to move through the profession. And I'd like to stop having conversations about uh, work-life balance. Um, I'd like to stop thinking that that's the only thing that we need to be talking about. And what I'd like to talk about is obligations to make space and opportunity for women uh, to get access to the, the critical uh, pathways that they need, which is client contact, being first chair, getting the business introductions that they need, all of that. That's what we need to be focusing on so that we can, we can make our way through and, and we don't give up, which is what happens. I mean, nobody leaves a job that they love, that they're getting fulfilled by, right? They leave a job because they think, this is exhausting and I'm, I'm met with walls everywhere and I just don't see a clear path forward. So I, I think those are the, the critical things. I don't want you to be left with the impression that I'm unmindful or it didn't stand in my way. I think I was not focused on it because of how I saw myself and I did not see myself as any different and so when you become aware that you are viewed differently, you know, then you say, okay, well, let me explain to you why uh, I'm here. And I always thought uh, I wasn't less than any man. I figured I was better than and if they didn't know, then I would show them. And I did. So I just have to remind, it's exhausting, you have to, you, you just, 
it's the exhausting part is to constantly remind and prove yourself. But unfortunately, that's, that's part of the game. But there are a cadre of lawyers, and I'm speaking seriously of people you know, who are in Tucson, Mint, who you know, fight just as hard and are prepared to have a debt or some debt. I, I don't, I mean, maybe, I don't know. I don't, okay. <laughs> I, I'm sure there are, but I've, I've never, uh, I don't view myself as being championed by by that. I, I think I think we prove ourselves, and I, I think we uh, we. Bring yeah, I just I just got table. reduced to mush. So, yeah. <laughs> right in front of your eyes, you saw the Marie Han Han and forensic Sorry. skills. Uh, no, anyway. it's okay. Yeah, but but I'm your champ. <laughs> <laughs> I will tell you that. So so let me ask you this: um, You're involved in a famous case. Many of you will know what case this is. Uh, and it was all over the media, and it involved a high-profile individual, and that's all I'm going to say. And you won the case, but you, your defense and your victory was denigrated by pundits in the media, by a large segment of social media. And you, you write about being exhausted after the trial, and you, you don't do press interviews, and I've actually experienced this with you during trials. It's just not part of who you are. And then after winning the trial, you sat back and watched. You thought maybe the feverish pitch would die down, but instead it accelerated. You write about actually people going to the streets and marching in protest about this case. And you felt like the sky was falling down. Yeah, remember, remember I just thought. And, uh, and that you were very stressed out about this, and you did something very unusual. You gave an interview, which turned out to be a two-part interview, to Peter Mansbridge on the CBC National. So my first question about this is, why did you, why the shift? Why did you decide in this case? I'm gonna speak on the press. Uh, well, I, I, as I say, I, I didn't want to, um, and I resisted uh, for quite some time. I offered all sorts of other people that I thought would be really excellent on, on this program. <laughs> I even suggested I would contact them, I could put a, a group together. Uh, part of that was uh, not only because I didn't want to do it, but because I didn't think um, the public would hear me. That they would, uh, that this was such an important moment to explain what it is that we do that it would be wrong if I were the person doing it, uh, that it, it wouldn't resonate, it wouldn't be heard. So that was my real reluctance. And after um, speaking to uh, my partner, Danielle, and my husband, people I trust, they were adamant that I needed to be the one to finally speak and, and sort of try to explain what was, what was happening. You know, I can tell you this is true, that they didn't shoot the interview in the studio because a, they didn't want to, they didn't want anyone to know about it because they thought I would cancel at the last moment. That's how resistant I was to doing it. And after it aired, I didn't watch it, but I heard there was a second part. I emailed Peter Mansbridge and I said, you know, I, I'm glad you liked the interview, but um, I think there's one person in this country that definitely doesn't want to see a second um, installment of it, and so would you consider not airing the second part of my interview? And he said, no, but thank you for your email. Said, okay. um, That's a very Canadian way. <laughs> exactly. Um, so uh, I felt an enormous weight and obligation because I really do love and value what we do, that members of the public would not at least have a little bit more information about what we, what we do, and that you know, I would hate if at the end of the day I was the person responsible for having embarrassed the administration of justice and have not done a good job of um, upholding our values and, and what we do. Uh, so that was the thing that was really honestly driving it for me and so I, I did this interview and I thought nobody would watch it. Um, and uh, so as I, after I did it- It was it, on the national. I know, <laughs> but I, I, I'm like that. So after I did the interview, um, my, my partner Danielle was watching it from the doorway and so I walked out and I said, so what'd you think? She said, I think it was really good. I said, no, no one's even gonna see this, so forget about it. Um, but it, it was, uh, it was watched. Now, that takes me to, I mean, and the thing that Marie hasn't told you is that this verdict wasn't just sustainable. You know, the verdict was right, uh, the judge was in 
impeccable in terms of the judgment he gave. And, and so when you're looking at this in context, it's important uh, to remember that. But something unusual happened after it aired, and that was the response you got, the letters you received. So, so tell us about that. Well, you know, going back to one of the questions you asked, which is what, what was one of the most, um, what's the most important moment to you as a, as a criminal lawyer? And I've talked about that, but I would say one of the most important moments in my life was what, what resulted from that interview. Uh, I received letters from across the country, including even from soldiers, Canadian soldiers stationed um, uh, overseas, saying they had seen it uh, and that they felt very proud of our justice system and that I was um, a true Canadian to be proud of. And I just, uh, you know, I still get emotional when I think yeah. of it. I still have those letters. But I took those letters over to my parents and I said, I got to read you something. And it wasn't that they were saying great interview, it was that they were saying you're a Canadian. It was such a meaningful moment and probably you know, one of the most significant moments in, in my career. You know, if, if we draw a trajectory, Marie, from the beginning of this conversation to now, think back to what you said about Eddie Greenspan. Mm -hmm. About Eddie Green, you know, there was a question asked, and I'm not criticizing the question, but you know, what about criminal lawyers, you know, doing what they do, how do you do it? And the point is that there's a nobility, and that was what you said about Eddie Greenspan, the nobility of defending someone charged with a crime when you're the only one in that courtroom who stands up for that individual against a whole system that has no interest whatsoever in protecting that individual's rights. And did you get a, this is, a, this is a, an interesting question though, did you get a different perspective? Did that change your view of the way the public I, I think what it taught me is that we don't do a very good job of explaining what we do. Mm -hmm. I, I think um, you know what you what the members of the public see often is just shows on TV, and so they don't understand it. And I don't blame them. And I just think we're lousy at at letting it, anyone into the club to see what we do. You know, I always say when people say, you know, can you tell me about it? I say, you know, the best thing to do is to come and watch it. Come and see and make your own. Make your own judgment. You'll like some stuff, you won't like some stuff, but come and see what your justice system is doing because it truly is, and I'm not drinking the Kool-Aid here, it is extraordinary that you can go into court and you can end up cross-examining the prime minister of this country. What an unbelievable, unprecedented thing that you can challenge a law, that you can challenge what the police do to you. you I mean, it is incredible that we have this Freedom. It is a freedom that in this country we can go in and we can say what we want. We can challenge uh, the laws. We can change them, uh, and that that's a real, real privilege. And I think we are lousy at explaining to our community yeah, what we have. Unfortunately, we don't have time for questions. I, I'm just going to tell a story because I do want. I do owe it to the people watching to finish finish on time. So I'm just going to tell you a story about Marie and then see if you want to comment on that. Oh, but no. it's nice. You know, oh, okay. I told All you, right. I'm only going to make you <laughs> shy today, Marie. I promise right. you. So, you know, I read a lot about Marie, her forensic skills, brilliant cross-examiner, which she is, and um, the way she conducts a case, the way she commands a courtroom. But in my view, that's not her greatest skill. So I'm going to share a secret with you and then see what Marie says, because I've done cases with Marie. Her greatest skill is the prodig prodigious preparation that she brings to the case. It, it, it's extraordinary. Every witness, every inconsistency, every catalog, carefully drawn up. And the reason I think it's the most impressive part of her skill is that Marie understands that's the foundation for everything else that follows in the court, because you're never going to have of a witness that's devastating. You're never going to have that jury address that persuades the jury to take a completely different point of view that they initially had, unless you've done that kind of assiduous preparation. Agree or I, I, you know, I agree. I, I practice doing a lot of civil litigation now as well, and I, I think, you know, whatever it is that we're doing, um, you owe it to your clients to do everything you can. 
Um, and there's no short-circuiting that. That's the one thing I say that's lousy about being a lawyer, is that you never sort of graduate from school. You're always studying, but you owe that. Uh, you owe that level of commitment um, to all of your clients. That's, that's what they're coming to you for. Well, that's, that's such a nice note to end, our, to end our conversation tonight. And so, uh, first of all, on behalf of professional and community, the community at large, people watching on live stream, the people attending here. interview. I hope I wasn't too hard. No, you were lovely. Thank okay. you, Steve. Okay. Thank you all. And so thank you. So, and um, so again, just, just to the people on live stream, thank you so much for watching. I know you're all around the world. And please remember, you can get a copy of Marie Hennon's book, a signed copy, if you phone the Beth Sholem Synagogue. For those of you here, we have a lovely, elegant dessert prepared for you. And um, Please, please stay. Marie is going to stay for that hour. And again, I remind you, please just take a short period of time with her because a number of people are going to want to speak to her. And thank you all for coming, and thank you for being part of the evening. Again. <laughs>